right, so uh, welcome uh, everyone. Um, <clears throat> uh, I was told we are still exploring chess legends of the past. And uh, if, if you were a part of the last lecture, you know that I uh, did, went over a few games of Vasily Ivanchuk and I really enjoyed that. And this time around, um, Greg Shahadi reached out to me and was like, hey, like, um, do you have any player in particular? And I, I actually only had to ask for one player and I was shocked that no one had already done him. And it was uh, Capablanca. And the reason it was so shocking to me is first of all, he's a world champion, um, but it was just like, he's actually one of the really memorable ones, you know? I mean, you might say they're all memorable, but Capablanca is the one that everyone kind of knows or has heard of. And it's especially fitting for me because, you know, when I was growing up and coming out, I was always known as Casablanca. <laughs> so that was, a, it was just a, you know, funny kind of, I guess, fate in a way that um, I'm able to actually do this, uh, this, uh, this one with uh, on Capablanca. So I'm very happy about that. Now, uh, a little few words about Capablanca. Um, he was a world champion, um, I believe, oh, I, I'm really, this should be Wikipedia. Uh, I should have come a little bit more, but I believe he was world champion from 21 to 27, 1921 to 1927, I believe, so nearly a century ago. And um, really, when I think about um, Capablanca as, you know, uh, a great player and what his, his mark, what, he, what, what mark he left on the game, I think about like technical positions and really uh, middle, really excellent middle game and gameplay. And uh, I consider him the guy that, you know, Kramnik and Carlson and these, you know, the great technicians of, of today uh, really kind of looked at his games and really admired. Even Fisher, I mean, they all could find uh, and take, use a little bit of Capablanca in their own games because his technical skill was so fascinating. So uh, I actually had, I have four games. I doubt I'm gonna get through the four games. I never do um, uh, the game collection. So hopefully we can at least hit one or two and uh, you know really talk quite extensively about the decisions he takes. Now, there's one thing I wanna say when looking at games from the past, um, because it's extremely important. And it's something that like, frankly, my chess history and my knowledge of chess history is not great um, because I, I never had a coach. And quite frankly, I, I can almost recall every game from like the early 2000s and onward. But before that, my history was actually quite poor. Um, I mean, of course there's Kasparov and Karpov sprinkled in there and, you know, but way back when I'm saying my history is quite poor. And when you go over these games, what, what the thing I'll advise you to do is not focus too much on the opening, just because we've had so many developments since then. So you'll notice inaccuracies in the play, be like, wait, they went there, they went there. And really focus on the, the game that takes the course after the opening, because that's when, you know, these players, these great players are quite frankly, just as good um, as the players of today. I mean, I mean, of course, not exactly as good, but pretty, pretty darn close. And so keep that in mind as we go through these games. Now, the first game I'm going to show is uh, actually a long one. It's between David Janowski, who... Uh, Janowski uh, has an opening named after him, so you might have uh, you might have heard that name before. And uh, Capablanca was black here, so and this was played in uh, 1916, so not quite world champion uh, uh, Capablanca yet, but pretty pretty good player. So, anyways, let's take a look. All right, so d4, knight f6, knight f3, d5, c4, c6. And we already have uh, a Slav on our hands, or maybe a semi-Slav. We'll find out. I think I kind of ruined it by saying Slav. Um, and here after knight c3, again, I think the majority of people watching right now are going to cringe when they see Black's next move. Um, and I want someone to tell me why. So the move that Black played here, Capablanca played here, was bishop f5. Um, now. Hopefully you uh, you recoiled slightly, like you you had some awareness, like oh, Bishop F five, what's going on with that? And I want someone to tell me why Bishop F five is an accuracy. So uh, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna allow some the the youngsters here to you know take a look and uh, to tell me why this inaccuracy. Um, I I don't I see. Okay, so, um, 
hmm, who am I gonna? I'm gonna I'm gonna reach out to Arnov. Can you uh can you tell me what you're what you're thinking? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so after Queen B three, then Black has to defend black can defend with Queen B six. And after C five, Queen takes B three, A takes B three. White's A1 rook has an open file. And you could also go for B4, B5. Gotcha. So I'll, I'll put that on the board just to, to, sh to show it. So queen B3, queen B6, C5, queen takes B3, A takes B3. And you're saying B4, B5 with the half open A file for the white rook is going to create tremendous pressure. You know, that's a compelling argument. It really is. Um, and I do think that white has pressure here. Um, this is a pattern we're actually going to see a bit in the game. Um, so a little bit of foreshadowing there, but it's actually not the best sequence. Um, and uh, I, I purposely uh, called on you just because I, I think that's actually would be a very common refrain. And in fact, queen b3 was actually what was played in the game. <laughs> but the best move here is to actually start with c takes d5. And um, the reason for that is because uh, Frankly, black is going to lose a pawn if they do go for the same sequence with queen b6. So shout out to um, you know to to, to Zoe Tang and a, and a few others that really recognize that. Uh, but we're going to have keep it moving. So I'm not going to call it every, everyone that uh, gets it right. But basically, the point is, is that after c takes d5, queen b3 here, the b7 pawn is under attack. And if you play queen b6, knight takes d5 queen takes b3 and knight takes the f6 check is just an intermediate move that picks up uh, a pawn. And um, we have all the advantages that uh, Arnav mentioned in the previous line, except that uh, like we have the half open a, a file and so on, except that now we have a central pawn to the good and it's nearly winning, I would say. Like uh, if you check with computers, I think they say like 1.4 or whatever. So it's pre pretty much nearly winning and it's just a huge issue. So you really want to start with c takes d5. Now, uh, most people that have played this law before have fallen for this at one point or another. And I will say that if you do fall for this and you go to queen b3 um, and you, you just miss this detail, I'd recommend actually playing bishop c8. As ugly as it looks, um, uh, it's at least mathematically, I believe the best move and you just kind of admit your mistake and kind of keep it moving from there. Um, but of course, it's a horrible, horrible thing to just go back. And just people, some people might be wondering why not b6, uh, just defending the pawn. Uh, that tactically fails to e4, oh, not e3, e4. And their tactics with bishop b5 check and knight e5, and sometimes queen takes f7 maiden, um, it just doesn't work. So basically, uh, Cabo Blanca played bishop f5 before taking on c4. And of course, today we understand that d takes c4 is actually the better move because uh, you prevent the queen from going to b3, and then you do have the bishop to f5 afterward. And uh, if they want to, if white wants to get the pawn back, they go a4 first, um, because if they push the e pawn right away, then black has b5. More theory than I wanted to get into, but important to make that distinction. And I know I said, ignore opening, because the, uh, when, when sometimes you're looking at the greats of, of the past, because you will see things that bother you and then you'll dismiss the game, but the game can actually be of quite significant quality. So uh, anyways, back to the game. So knight c3, bishop f5, queen b3, and queen b6 was played. And this is actually one of my, um, favorite kind of discussions or tensions in chess. Um, I like to call it the queen b3, queen b6 dilemma because both sides really would like the other to take. Um, why is that? Why is that? Anyone have any idea why, what's so compelling about the queen b3, queen b6 dynamic? Uh, Zoe, talk to me. Or did you, are you, uh, do you have a... Uh... Yeah, so um, there we go. Wh whoever takes the queen allows the other side to get a semi-open A-file and then the other side's A-pawn would be weak. Exactly, exactly. So the semi-open A-file actually factors more than the double pawns in like 90% of cases. Um, so basically, just as we saw in the previous line with white getting the half-open file, um, you know, black gets that half-open file, they're also very happy. So in a lot of circumstances, you'll see 
one side kind of compelling the other to take. And in modern chess, um, just as Arnav pointed out, c5 happens a lot, kind of compelling the other side to take. And usually the best course of action is actually not to capture, it's to go back and admit that you have a space disadvantage because um, the, the counterplay on the half open a file is actually pretty significant. So um, thanks for pointing that out, Zoe. So anyway, so queen b3, queen b6, and now white actually played queen takes b6. So um, again, we forget the opening, but this is obviously not ideal because after a takes b6, now black has that uh, open file. Uh, and now after c takes d5, knight takes d5, really excellent exchange by uh, Capablanca because after knight takes d5, c takes d5, this knight is kind of left the queen side a little bit soft. Um, and then all of a sudden, black actually, um, I actually would slightly prefer to play black um, because even though the vision is probably close to equal, there are a few factors um, that are quite nice. First of all, um, the half open a file is a factor. Second of all, this knight on the queen side is actually more valuable than the knight on the king side, given the fact that um, the queens are off the board, there really aren't any attacking chances. It's safe to say a lot of the play will be I'm trying to draw arrows from the C to the A file, but essentially a lot of the play will be on the queen side. And so you can really anticipate that those, the difference in the knights and the half open file is pretty significant. And then also I would say the quality of the bishops, this bishop on F5 is really staring down a pretty meaningful diagonal. And it's pretty doubtful the white bishop on F1 will get uh, the same type of scope. So all those things would lend itself to like a symbolic advantage to black, in my opinion, even though um, the position is really equal. So anyways, uh, c takes e5, e3. Uh, that's normal. I, um, you could argue for the bishop coming out to f4, but it's not really hitting anything here. Um, so it's not super impressive. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it could, it's maybe not. It's an option. Um, e3, knight c6, bishop d2. And now this is the move that I think would shock most people because it definitely was not on my horizon. And I think this is a move that really just shook me when I went over. And so I, I wanna see if anyone here can, um, maybe someone's seen the game actually, but could predict what Capablanca played in this position. And even if you didn't get, even if you don't have the move, I wanna, um, I wanna hear why, why you play this move. So I, uh, Ryo. Talk to me. Yeah, I wanted to play e5. So, for example, it takes with the knight. And then after knight b4. Okay, yeah. So now he can take. So he has to play bishop b5. Check. Oh, no, what am I? Oh, no, great. All right. So so you're calculating in, re you're calculating in real time, and I respect that. That's what you have to do. Uh, no, not be afraid to make suggestions. Uh, Bishop B5 um, so, doesn't work. It doesn't work. Never mind. Yeah, yeah. So basically, what Ryo is saying, just for the people out there, is that E5, Knight takes E5, Knight B4. So you're trying to get some real counterplay over here um, with Knight C2, but you need to discard, oh, Bishop B5 check, and there's no good square for the king, and there's a fork on F7 if the king steps away, and uh, you were not really feeling the idea anymore. Um, but nice try. Um, let me see if there's any other uh, suggestions. Mm -hmm -hmm. Aryan, Aryan, sorry, Aryan. Talk to me. Uh, here, I think maybe E6. E6, uh, what was yeah. your idea with E6 just to keep uh, developing? Similar idea to Ryo's, except you're not giving a pawn. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, I respect E6 a lot. I think it's a, like kind of like a normal move to keep developing. Um, it's it's not what Capablanca played. And I, it's funny, when I was looking at this position uh, and thinking about, I did not consider Capablanca's move, to be honest. And I don't even think it's the best move, but it's a very instructive plan. The moves that came on my radar were actually F6 and H5. And the reason I considered both of those moves was because they both preserve my light squared bishop. Uh, I was a little concerned after E6 if knight H4 would be an issue. 
um, just because the bishop is is so valuable in these positions. Like I don't wouldn't want to drop back to g6, and I was concerned about some h3 g4 business if I went around the horn like this. So uh, I really didn't want to lose light squared bishop. And I thought that h5 would be a nice alternative just to ensure you keep the bishop on the diagonal and. As we've learned from Alpha Zero, you know it's nice to take space with rook pawns, right? Um, so uh, that was something I thought about. F6 does the same thing, but restricts the knight from jumping in to the center. So now, if they go knight h4, I can consider going to f7 if need be. Um, but um, the move that Capablanca played is truly remarkable, and is actually Bishop d7. And um, I, there was someone in the chat that uh, that found this move so uh, can, very very impressive if you did, um, but it seems very counterintuitive. Why basically bring the bishop back to d7 when it's already on a decent diagonal? Um, what does this really do? And I think the answer is that well, you'll basically see the answer in the next few moves. But um, so just stay tuned. Let, let me put it that way before I explain it away. So, anyways, bishop d7. Um, uh, White played bishop e2. I think this is a mistake. And um, I think it's another thing I wanted to mention at the beginning when I uh, was saying what to look for when you when you look at some of these old games. I think the first thing is disregard the opening to a certain extent or don't take it as like the be end all be all. The second thing I want to point out is um, just how much defense has kind of changed in the past um, even just 20 years, but of course 100 years. Um, it, Basically, players today are so much more tenacious and the, they, their understanding of the drawing margin is much wider. And so you're going to see a lot of games from the past when they're annotated. Um, and even like 10, 20 years ago, frankly, where it's just like, you know, white played normal moves and black won the game. And that was the net logical flow of the game. And what I really want you to, I want to push back on that narrative and instead have you think about, okay, well, the position is not good, but White's not losing or anything, or, you know, there's, this shouldn't have been a loss. There were still ways to fight. And Bishop E2 is just a perfect example of that. I think if I asked uh, everyone in the chat now to type what their move would be if they were to develop that light squared bishop, they would probably put it somewhere else. So, um, uh, so yeah, just type, type in the chat now, and I'll, I'll read out some of the things that I see here, or just the most popular move I see in the chat. Um, but, yeah, so I, I'm seeing... Um, Okay, so I'm seeing uh, some different squares, but the one that I'm seeing the most right now is D3, right? And it, and it seems kind of logical, like why not D3? It's the longest diagonal. Um, it's the one that we just spoke about, you know, the bishop coming to F5 was kind of nice on that. So it's like, why put it on E2? It's just passive. And I think this move is, is already a slight inaccuracy, even though the evaluation doesn't change dramatically. It's just important to think about where you can improve on a game where it seems like it was one-way traffic. Because in every game, it kind of takes two to tango. Um, one side has to make it an accuracy after an accuracy after an, after an accuracy. And that's how the game turns. So it's important to keep that in mind. So anyway, white did play bishop e2. Um, and black played e6. Um, again, I, I mentioned we'll see the contours of black's pen in a little bit. Uh, and now castles, bishop d6, rook fc1, king e7. Bishop c3 and rook hc8. And I think this is a perfect example uh, here to just kind of, or perfect moment rather, to get a snapshot of the position. Because if you look at the, the position, it's nearly symmetrical, but there's some very major differences. And I want someone here to point out difference by difference um, what, what, what are the differences here. So is that, if anyone wants to, uh, to give it a go, uh, I'll, I'll be happy to um, to seed the floor. And I, I, I love new voices too. All right, Austin. You're, you're, you, uh, you got a mic that works? I'm trying to unmute. Maybe not. Oh, there we go. Okay, there we go. Uh, so I think uh, the differences are that Black has an open A file. 
All right, so so the so black has a half open A file because of the, the double pawns. Okay. What else? Uh the bishop on c3 is really bad. All right, so the bishop on c3 is very bad compared to the bishop on d6. Why is it very bad? Because it's uh like blocked by a pawn chain and also uh it doesn't really have a future in the next few moves. Okay. Uh what else? So we have the open A file, we have the difference in the bishops. What else? Uh, and it's okay to say I'm not sure. I don't know. That's fine. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. All right. So uh, I'm gonna. Oh, I'm, I see some other hands. So uh, Evan, do you wanna uh, do you wanna add to that at all? Um, I think it's sort of like equal in space in general. Um. There's a slight difference, um, but I think Black has sort of the upper hand here with the open files he could use while White is not really activating his rook sense stuff, so. Right, so I think you just characterized the position quite well, but what I was looking for was there are a few other factors, and I'm gonna point them out now. So besides the bishop and the, maybe, and the file. Maybe, maybe Black's doubled pawns. Okay, so we, we mentioned the double pawns. The other thing, the other thing is the knights. The knight on c6 is definitely much better than the knight on f3 um, because the knight is actually kind of influencing on the queen side where the where we see the all the pieces kind of tilted. And the knight on f3 doesn't have great influence unless it comes through uh, the e5 square. The last thing, and probably one of the most important things, is the king position. This king is on e7 uh, because it just moved up from e8 to e7, and white actually elected to castle. Now, there will be moments where, you know, in a queenless middle game, uh, castling makes a lot of sense, but there will be more, uh, well, I don't want to say there'll be more instances because, I mean, you know, it's a little bit reckless, but there are going to be a lot of instances where it's much better just keep the king in the center because you're closer to the skirmish and you have an understanding that you're not going to be checkmated anytime soon. Um, so one of the first things I think about when, you know, you know, queens are uh, coming off the board is whether I need, even need to castle, you know. Um, and there are a lot of openings today where, we, where we've kind of seen this and understood this, like uh, just think of the Berlin Wall, for instance, right? The king is on, uh, is on D8 and, you know, can't castle and it seemed black seems to be doing okay, right? So Basically, uh, that's something to really think about. And White took time to actually castle and do this when it probably would have been better on E2. <laughs> and so that's another reason why this Bishop D3 move was vastly superior to Bishop E2 uh, mo uh, a long time ago. And again, it's those little differences. Every small difference doesn't mean so much just on its own. But when you add those up, it's actually uh, quite significant. And so if you think about every small difference is like, you know, a tenth of a pawn here, or a quarter of a pawn there. That can be, you know, that can be, that can be three point seven five for those that use engines, or 0.5. You know, those those little things really add up. So, anyways, after rook hc8, white played a3, and this is already kind of, I think, showing that you know white really kind of was a little bit frustrated with the course of the game and was already frustrated by the pressure on the a file because all of a sudden here you covered the a3 pawn, but you've created new weaknesses. And whenever a pawn is pushed, you want to think about the squares that are weakened. Whenever you push a pawn, you weaken the squares adjacent um, to where the pawn is. Um, uh, so, and if you move it two squares, you weaken uh, more. So for instance, if g4 is played, you weaken those four squares. If e4 is played, you weaken these squares. Very, very important thing about that. And A3, it's just like, oh, thank you. B3 is very weak. And so Cabo Blanca, um, unsurprisingly, played knight A5. And all of a sudden, B3 is an issue. Uh, you know, knight can maybe coming to C4 is an issue. And, uh, you know, black is, is getting, in, getting in somehow. So um, knight A5, knight D2, F5. I, I didn't totally agree with this, but I respect it. Um, Kyle Blanca decided not to uh, not to allow e4. Uh, my instinct was to go b5 right away, 
but I think Cabo Blanco was concerned about something like E4, D takes E4, Knight takes E4, and then some activity connected to Bishop E4 check, uh, which I, I can respect. So, um, so Cabo Blanco elected to not even allow any counterplay, and that's another thing. Of course, in endgames, we always talk about being a little bit more patient and methodical, not allowing counterplay, and, and maybe also astutely kind of observing that, well, okay, I've weakened the E5 square, but this knight can't really take advantage of it right now because, you know, they have liabilities on the queen side to worry about. So, um, so after F5, G3 was played pretty aimless, doesn't really, you know, deal with the, the issue, which is this queen side, and now B5. And you can already see, you know, on both sides of the board, the, the kind of boa constrictor type of play that we, um, we see, uh, you know, Carlson do today, which see Kramnik did uh, when he was playing. Um, all right, so Zoe has a question. What, what if F3 instead of G3? Yeah, I mean, I, that's an interesting move. Um, I, I don't, yeah, that's an interesting move. I guess the idea is just to play e4 and to press onward in that fashion. Yeah, I, I prefer I prefer f3 to g3. I really do. Um, and the fact that I'm even thinking about about what to do now <laughs> really already confirms that it's a a great uh, a much better try than g3. And again, I, this is really good, really good thinking because you want to be able to do this when you go over games and be like, okay, it, the trend has not been in White's favor, but how do we buck the trend? How do we disrupt? And so, um, yeah, uh, I, you're definitely disrupting. I still want to try and get my knight to c4, but yeah, I'm a little bit annoyed with e4 break. I don't know if I'd start with bishop c6 to discourage e4 perhaps, um, and then go b5, knight c4. I'm not completely sure. Um, another question really quickly I'm going to answer as can't tell if bishop on d7 is good or bad. Is it bad because of pawns, but it makes the whole plan possible, good or bad? I think it's actually a really great question and we're gonna see it kind of answered towards the end of the game. But what I'll say for now is, and this is something that has really helped me um, to understand um, this in the last few years, frankly, is oftentimes space is more important, or excuse, let me put it this way, more often than not, space is more important than squares. And what I'm, or, or a color complex. And what I mean by that is right now you say, oh, these pawns are on light squares, the bishop on d7 is limited, but really the space will always be a more dominant factor than a weak square. And, and usually when you're going forward, you're giving up something because when you move pieces, right, you're always, you're always moving a piece away from like what it was protecting before. So if you go, like I said, if you push a pawn, you're weakening square somewhere. But the point is usually the, the gains that you get matter more than what you're actually giving up. And so uh, as long as you're able to maintain your space and, and kind of responsibly take care of it, um, the pieces will find avenues to kind of thrive and do a good job. But space will usually be the dominant factor. So um, of course, so some might say, well, what about a Dutch stone wall? Like, I mean, black is not doing so great there. Well, in a lot of those, in, the, in that system, a lot of time, um, they have significant issues with their pawn structure on the queen side, and there's certain tensions on the queen side that undermine the space, and so it, it's it's a lot less firm. Here, there's no pressure on Black's queen side at all. I mean, Black is the one driving the bus, and so it, that's kind of the difference here, and I hope that answers part of your question. I think the game will actually really answer the rest of that question, because we're, we'll see the bishop play a role. So anyways, uh, instead of f3, g3, b5, uh, coming into this massive, massive outpost on c4, um, f3 now, um, yeah, uh, it could have been argued uh, for sure, Zoe, that f3 should have been played instead of g3, um, uh, knight c4, and now bishop takes c4. And again, this is the type of move that like, I'm sure many of you today be like, oh my gosh, bishop takes c4, why not just King F2, we're holding the fort, or so and so on and so forth. And this is what happens when you when you kind of you know put the pressure on for an extended period of time. Uh, frustration sets in, and it's really important to already recognize just how difficult it was for White to make moves. So 
Let's say, just for argument's sake, white plays king f2 and then black plays h6, just for argument's sake. I want to point out here that the a pawn can't move, right? Because it, it then it hangs. The b pawn can't move because then the a pawn hangs. The rook on a1 can hardly move. Um, the bishop can't move because then the knight is lost. The rook on c1 can't move because then there's a knight takes a3 tactic, uh, picking up a pawn and, and probably the game and the bishop pair and so on. So basically, already you can see so many of the pieces I've just highlighted are like pretty much stuck, all because of the activity on the queen side here. And it's like, well, my gosh, like how, uh, you know, that, that type of thing will make you, um, you know, blink and, and make, a, make a concession. And it's these types of concessions that you're able to extract if you put pressure for an extended piece of, uh, an extended period of time. So after knight c4, bishop takes c4 is played. And of course, after b takes c4, we can see the game has changed drastically. I mean, you basically have a situation where now the pawn structure is, is all better, even though it wasn't a huge issue. Um, that bishop on d7 is now uh, going to really factor. The pawn on b2 is backward. Uh, black, again, black has the two bishops. Black has more space. The pieces can still hardly move. Not pretty. So Anyways, I don't think there's, uh, I think we can kind of see the trend kind of going the wrong way. So maybe we're not going to spend so much time move by move from here on out, but you can just see how that manufacturing of all those little small advantages made a difference. So let's take a look at what happened next. So E4, uh, basically trying to get an E5 and forcing the, the dark squared bishop off the diagonal. King F7, uh, not allowing that, giving the bishop some room. E5, a move I was pretty critical of when I saw because this knight on D2 really is not doing anything. So um, instead, I would recommend e, D, a, T, e takes D5 and then F4, at least trying to get the knight into play. And I think, again, this is extremely unpleasant, um, but not lost, not even close. And so, again, there's even when it seems like dire, there's usually stuff to do. Um, and ways to improve. And I, again, the level of defense between, you know, even in the past 10 years, 20 years is just insane. Um, so many of you know, you analyze with computers and you're like, oh, the computer says I'm fine, you know? So uh, anyway, so E4, King F7, E5, Bishop E7. We have some more moves, B5, the prepar prep preparatory move looking uh, to play B4. And now it's just a nightmare um, because you have to constantly worry about B4. Um, the bishop on C3 is very limited scope. And I guess the last question I would ask here, um, just because uh, you know the rest of the game really is kind of you know black pushing on both sides, is what if white tried to play bishop B4 and kind of slow things down? Because if I got a few moves to go knight b1, knight c3, you know, maybe I'm actually holding on here. Uh, but how, what's the right way for black to kind of break through here and finish this one? I'm gonna take, I, I, I ate dinner already, so I'm, that's why I'm eating uh, gelato. So don't mind me while I wait for uh, answers. Um, all right, I got, I got some answers I, I like, so. Aradia, can you uh, tell me what you're thinking? Yeah, so my idea was um, bishop take b4, a take b4, rook a4, and then like we attack the b4 pawn, and we, I'm pretty sure just force uh, like rook take a4, but then we go b take a4, and we're, I'm pretty, oh, I, uh, we're gonna like pick up the b4 pawn with uh, rook b, um, rook take b4. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. Um, yeah, just, I mean, really, really good thinking. So basically the, the problem is, is that this knight just cannot even begin to get to b4 and, or to c3 in time to really stop the infiltration. And I think it was just important to recognize here that it's, excuse me, it's almost like the rooks are kind of in mutual zutzwang in a way, because, you know, if you think about it, neither side wants to give the other side the file. And so whenever you have that staring contest, you think about how you can build on the file. And usually you can build with a pawn. And so what I mean by build is specifically with what Aradia said, which is rook a4, you're building on the file so that, you know what, I can double, I'm attacking this pawn. You pretty much have are compelled to take. 
And then unfortunately, after, um, after Rook takes A4 and B takes A4, uh, the B pawn is just lost. And, you know, it's almost like, you know, if you've ever seen a bunch of dominoes uh, tiles, you know, you hit one and then the rest of them just all fall down. And so, uh, yeah, that would just be completely winning. Um, so yeah, very good, very good observation. Um, so yeah, so basically bishop b4 can't be played. This makes the bishop truly a, a, a pawn, right? It really has no, not nowhere to go. And uh, yeah, white is just left to kind of wait. And rook a4 happened, you know, thinking about the rook a8 and b4 ideas, rook c a8. And then I love this move, h6, saying, I have all the gains on the on the on the queen side. I, B4 is hanging over your head constantly. You can't push the B pawn because then you hang the A pawn. And now I'm going to tease out G5 and that principle of the two weaknesses, right? Like we've heard that before. You you tickle a little bit here, you you poke a little bit over there, and eventually everything just collapses. And that's exactly what is happening here. It's just, I mean, just textbook textbook play. Um, and you know, once you get this <laughs> pressure over here, black switches back. Black says, you know what? I I'm gonna now play on the G file. And um, again, the position was not lost here. I should point that out. So black, white played knight G2, knight C2 was better. Um, Cause you also keep an eye on maybe trying to play bishop B4 yourself and trading without recash with the A pawn. And you also still eye the E3 square so that maybe you can try to challenge the rook coming into G4. Um, rook g4 happened and, um, or sorry, rook g, uh, rook g4 would not have been as potent in the, in the knight c2 line because there'd be rook g1, rook g8, takes, takes, and then apparently, you know, white is fighting here a little bit. I still have my reservations. Um, of course, you know, black is still, uh, pressure, has a lot of pressure in my opinion. And, uh, someone asked about, well, this bishop that, you know, is not, you know, going to be bad behind all these pawns. Again, I, I maintain that space is usually the most important asset. And all of a sudden, look at this bishop. If it rerouted this diagonal, it'd be an absolute monster. So um, especially because of the space that was created by these light, these pawns in the center. So anyways, uh, knight g2 happened. The rook came to g4. The, other, the rook swung around. It's quite nice where you saw it on the a file and switched to the g file. And now the breakthrough B4, uh, which is just really high class. Um, again, someone asked me, what about that light squared bishop? Well, how do you like them apples? Bishop A4, and uh, <laughs> all of a sudden it's slicing in from another direction. Um, now, again, I will say it's not completely over if white plays rook C1 and disrupts, disrupts the plan, right? Um, unfortunately, white played rook A1, and now the bishop came in with decisive effect and bishop e4 check is really, really nasty threat. And the B, the extra b pawn is not going anywhere. In fact, black could switch back at any moment and, and collect it. Um, but uh, there followed bishop g3, bishop e4 check, king f2, then h5. And all of a sudden there's pressure here. Let's, let's say the b4 pawn's also hanging. Uh, it just lights out. And uh, white played rook a7, and I'll stop here and, and give someone a moment to um, to find the the Capablanca knockout blow that um, that kind of had the position unravel. It did not last uh, more than a few more moves. Uh, Sanjana. So here, black could play bishop takes g2 with h4. Exactly right. So yeah, right on the money. Great answer. Bishop takes g2. Uh, of course, if king takes g2, h4 is a pin, um, right? And that's just winning a piece. And of course, rook takes g2, also h4, <laughs> because the rook is now uh, not uh, well placed. Um, white played bishop takes h4, just because they're picking up the bishop on e7, but it didn't really matter. And after a few more moves, the game actually ended. And here, uh, White resigned. Very, very nice game. Um, I, I just think it's a really good example of kind of, you know, 
pressuring on one side, going to the other, accumulating all these small little uh, advantages that add up to something more significant. So we had the king stay in the center as opposed to castling after the queens came off the board. We had the rook on the half open file pressuring that a pawn. We had the weak light squares that enabled the, the black knight to go knight a5, knight c4. All these little things, the, the difference in the bishops, right? The bishop on c3, we said, oh, that's, that's a terrible piece. All these little things really add up and um, something to be thinking about when you you play your games is just accumulating a bunch of small advantages and it leads to a winning position all the time. <laughs> I mean, it really does. It's remarkable. Um, and then you do need some cooperation from your opponent. Um, they need to, you know, just make a slight inaccuracy here, slight inaccuracy there. But you know, the truth is we all make them because we're human. And so <laughs> these are how games uh, are won in the modern era, right? Um, it's very rare that you are just winning a game straight from the opening because everyone is using computers. And so it's hard to just get a winning advantage from the opening and you have to outplay in the middle game. And then, you know, maybe even convert an end game and really instructive to see how you can make small gains. So um, yeah, it's, it's, something, it's, it's, it's something I really enjoy to do myself in my own games and um, pretty cool. Um, so I believe we have time for just another one because, uh, and Kostya, correct me if I'm wrong because uh, I, I, we're gonna, we're gonna go till about eight ish, I suppose, uh, maybe a little bit further than that. So I'll have to be a little bit quicker with this one, I believe. Um, so let me go find another game here. Oh, that's, it's always so hard to choose. You know, I, I look and I create these collections and then I weed, uh, uh, pair them down and then, then I have to make tough choices. So, um, I think the one I'm gonna make is, hmm. What to choose, what to choose. All right, there's this, there's the classic, there's this classic um, uh, rook end game that everyone has seen before. Um, so maybe I'll go for this, this other one. Although I, I very quickly, I'm gonna point out this, this rook end game, which everyone perceives to be a classic and it is, it's a great game. Um, let me go full board layout here. Um, I, uh, this is a game that, you know, Cabo Blanca played. Um, it's, it's in every rook end game. Uh, book lauds this game and deservingly so. It's an amazing game. The reason I'm going to zip through it, I don't actually don't want to go over this one. I just want to mention that you know when we when we're praising these types of games, which we always do, we neglect Black's defensive resource a lot. And I just want to point out here that even though White was better and doing great and everything, Black was not lost. Um, so just going to point out a few opportunities here really quickly. Um, here after h4, black played d5. Um, this was a very poor move um, because after d5, there were exchanges here and this allowed the h5, rook h1 maneuver that, uh, that actually allowed for this infiltration. Instead of, uh, of d5, knight takes c4 was far superior. And all of a sudden, if bishop takes c4, d5, we have a fork. Um, so I just, again, want to emphasize that you know, even in these games which feel like one-way traffic, you know, a lot of times the defending side is in the game right until the end. Very, very important to know. Uh, one more moment I just want to point out is we got we get to the rook end game because after knight e3 check, king f3, black plays knight f5. And then all of a sudden, this is the classic where bishop takes f5, king g3, and we use the F pawn as a shield to get in. And this is the, a beautiful, beautiful classic maneuver, which ultimately won Capablanca Blanc of the game. But it must be said that just a few moves before, um, after 93 check, King F3, there's, there's no need to go to this rook end game. Uh, not, no need at all. And black can go knight D1 and the situation is actually quite different. Uh, the C3 pawn is hanging. G6 is holding up the F pawn. You know, if you try to go something like rook h6, black has king g7. And so I just want to emphasize, you constantly want to be thinking about, well, what are the defending side's resources? And this is how you get better um, by not just thinking, oh, I played a great game and they there's nothing they can do. Um, so anyway, if you have not seen this game, I do encourage you to. Um, Cava Blanca, Tardicower, 1924. We're going to go to a, another game. I just wanted to point that out. So let me go to the game I actually wanted to show, which was this game with white against Mises. And 
Cabalanca was no longer world champion, actually, because this was 1928. But um, there's a white game that Cabalanca played against uh, Mises, and I thought it was a very, very nice game. Maybe a game that many people hadn't seen. I hadn't seen it before, before I prepared it for this class. So let's take a look. All right, so d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, d5, bishop g5. Okay, this is, this is nothing to complain about in the opening, um, I must say. Uh, Queen's Gambit declined. Um, Kyle Blanco was really good in the Queen's Gambit, it must be said. I mean, you can look at his games in the Queen's Gambit with white uh, and really high class. Like, I, I really strongly recommend anyone could get a very good understanding of the opening just by looking at his games uh, with white. Um, Knight f3, castles, rook c1. A, a typical finesse um, in this system is you try to delay the bishop for a few moves just so that if they take on c4, you get to c4 in one move. And so that's what Capablanca is doing here is he's not playing like bishop e2 right away because then d takes c4, bishop takes c4, and it's like white lost the half tempo in a way. Um, rook c1, a6, and c takes d5, e takes d5. And this is a position that I think we've had some discussion about before because it's kind of like a Carlsbad structure, right? Because of the cd5, ed5 nature. The difference is the pawn is actually on a6, which ironically we discussed Janowski before and the QD, QD, uh, QGD setup with a6 I, is, is the Janowski variation. It's with a quick, very quick a6. Um, and I just wanted to ask here, what would, what would be your plan with black? Because I think here, uh, well, I, let me actually make one more move for white. So white played queen b3. And here, I think this, yeah, I should play queen b3 and now ask the question, what is your, would be your plan with black? Because I think black fundamentally misunderstands what the course of action should be here. So I'm going to let you sit on that for about 30 seconds and try to figure out what would, what would your next few moves be with black? All right, so let me take a look at some of these responses. Um, mm -hmm. So I see all types of ideas, all types of ideas. Um, uh, Aradia, what are you thinking? Um. Yes, yeah, so I. I have two ideas. Well, my first idea was um to go like B. Uh, I like this one better. Um, to go B six C five, and then we might have like weakened pawns in the future. Um, but like um like we have a really big center, and if we can get like Rook B A and like maybe at some point like D four, I think we would be like have a good position. And my other idea was b6, a5, bishop, a6. But then a6 doesn't seem too good because you could have just went a5. So my immediate question for you is, are you concerned about knight takes d5 being a threat? Um, is that pawn, does that matter? Um, I don't think really. Like, because I'll, um, I'll like, t wait. Yeah, never mind. Um, I guess I'll just... Uh, Wait, yeah, I'm thinking like bishop b7 and I have a really open bishop because I think the bishop on c8 is the only big problem. So that pawn on d5 actually is kind of important because frankly, if you go like, let's just say it's white to move, knight takes d5, knight takes d5, queen takes d5, that's a clean central, central pawn, and you can't even bother the king with move like bishop b4 check um, because... Uh, there was there are going to be issues with your own queen, and so I, I think that pawn is actually pretty important. Um, and uh, you know, I mean, I can even see a situation where the king on d1 is actually quite okay. Like, I mean, again, this is I'm trying to make a move that doesn't waste a move. But let's say rook b8, just to just for argument's sake, takes, takes, takes. Let's say you get this check. Even after king d1, I don't. You're basically bishop g5 is hitting the queen on d8. Your bishop on b4 is kind of misplaced. The king is actually quite safe, I believe, right now in d1. And if you move the queen out the way, I, I get a second pawn. And if I go bishop d3 and king e2, my king is going to be quite secure, and the center is 
uh, you know, your center is just gone. Um, so very hard to kind of keep things together if you if you just lose that D5 pawn without, you know, really tangible compensation. Um, so that pawn matters. So now the question I'm going to ask, uh, again, is how do you deal with that pawn? Because queen b3 is putting pressure on the d5 pawn. This is very annoying to deal with. And, you know, you have to, you have to find a solution. So uh, I'm going to take one more answer, and then we're going to go through it. So uh, Daniel. I guess you can go c6, even though there's some dark score weaknesses. And, and I don't really want to go knight b8. So I guess c6, and then maybe a plan can be rook e8, knight f8, and getting a bishop out. Right. So I think that's the thing I would kind of instinctually look for as well. Um, C6 defending the D5 pawn, rook E8, and then you're playing like the classic kind of king's, uh, king's, um, uh, king, oh, sorry, not why am I say king's, I was going to say king's gambit. I mean, queen's gambit, exchange variation maneuvers with rook E8, knight F8, and so on. Um, but like you just said, the dark scores are a little bit sensitive. And I think it's really instructive to see how Cabo Blanca takes advantage of it because Kyle Blanca does play c6. Now, I spent a little bit of time looking at this position, and I think the solution is actually what should have been played is actually pretty illuminating because the best move here is actually, uh, I believe, h6. And the point of h6 is first you challenge this bishop on g5. So, you know, if they take on f6, you recapture with the knight, uh, no harm, no foul. Um, you're, you're very, Black would be very happy here. They've gotten the bishop pair. They're still covering d5. And, uh, you know, Black is doing great. So the logical move is bishop h4. And now, again, the d5 is still attacked, but here there's a little bit of a difference, and we can go for c5. And the point is that because the bishop is on h4, knight takes d5 is no longer a move because all of a sudden, tactically, the bishop and the queen are both hitting that uh, that bishop on h4, whereas on g5, that was not the case. So knight takes d5 was a problem because when the queen recaptured on d5, it was protecting that bishop. So all of a sudden you get c5, and then the queen doesn't really make sense on b3 anymore because uh, if you take on c5, well, knight takes c5 is a tempo. Um, you know, again, I mean, white is not, you know, losing or anything, but black is getting enough activity for the isolated pawn to kind of justify the setup. And um, I think a lot of times in queen's game positions, um, a lot of black players are very reluctant to play c5 to actually um, avoid getting an isolani when really the isolani is not the biggest problem in the position. So um, I'm just going to kind of throw that out there that look for c5 sometimes. Um, I'm sure there's some of you that play queen's gambit um, for either color or with one of the colors. And uh, look for that break because a lot of times people are just like, oh, my pawn shot is Isolani, the Isolani, and it's not as big a deal if you get all these gains for it. So anyways, uh, moving forward. So C6 was played and it's a very natural move, just kind of keeping everything together. But as Daniel mentioned, those dark squares are a little problematic and it's pretty nice to see how uh, Kyle Blanca just tears this apart. Because this is something, this is a Carlsbad structure with black. I wouldn't even mind playing. Um, so I have played. <laughs> so bishop d3, uh, normal move. Of course, we saw uh, we saw um, Janowski play bishop e2 in a, in a similar position. It's like, oh, dude, put on the right diagonal. Uh, knight h5, uh, typical maneuver to exchange uh, pieces. Um, now, I will say, if you're going for knight h5, it's you should, might as well start with h6. It doesn't hurt to um, to actually, you know, give your king an escape square and. Uh, you know, knight h5 is st might still be on the agenda, but okay. Um, knight h5, she takes e7, queen takes e7, castles. Knight f6, knight a4. Um, and now you can see just because the pawn is on a6 instead of a7, there are some problems. There are some liabilities here with the dark squares that, you know, really, really are difficult to kind of deal with. Um, and it kind of just changes, it changes the dynamic of the game because you're, you know, worried about, ooh, knight c5 comes very quickly or knight b6. How do you unravel and finish your development in a reasonable way? Um, Black played knight e4, and I wish I actually gave this as like a quiz question for what Black should have done instead of knight b4, but I think many of you might have solved the move. Um, so, um, 
instead of asking you what the move is, I'm gonna ask you why is 98 a much better choice? Arnav? And I'm trying to unmute you, but I don't know if it's working out. Um, Ar Aradya? Okay, so like my idea here is that like, uh, I think C4 is a much better square since all, um, my idea was to go like knight d6. And then like, I guess he has knight b6, but uh, my original idea was to go like b5. Um, and then like try like probably prepare uh like bishop b7 and then b5 c knight c4 and yeah that blocks the rook all right so you're not all the way off i think there's a lot there that was true um now i'm going to make a few minor corrections so first of all when you the knight on d6 is the quintessential Carlsbad knight you love a knight on d6 you're eyeing b5 you're eyeing c4 you're eyeing e4 Typically, you want to be a little bit careful about playing b5 before white has played b4. And the reason for that is because the c4 square isn't truly an outpost for your knight if they can kick you away with b3. And so with putting the knight on d6, you're not rushing in to play b5, but you're just kind of stabilizing your position. Um, the reason knight e4 was not as good and, um, uh, you know, as 98 as Zoe's actually kind of pointing out right now, is that white can actually trade the knight and prevent you from getting it to the d6 square. And so by putting it on e8, you don't allow that exchange. And once you get the knight to d6, you have some semblance of stability. Now, I still think white would have um, kind of an annoying, um, you know, annoying play based upon some of the dark square weaknesses on the queen side, but it's a big difference because after you play knight d6, black can try to move the bishop outside the pawn chain, um, maybe go, um, maybe even fix this knight on f6, uh, fix the knight on d7 and get maybe the bishop to e6 or g4, and you might have something going. So, and then of course, because black hasn't played h6, as I was suggesting earlier in the game, if the knight lands on e5, you can kick it away with f6 because the g6 square is actually still covered by the h7 pawn. So I know there's a lot of arrows there, but the point is that knight to d6 gives you tremendous stability that you just don't have otherwise. Um, and so after queen, after queen b3, knight e4, bishop takes e4, queen takes e4, and knight and queen b4, it's already a disaster because it's very, very difficult to prevent the queen from really torturing black on these dark squares. So black also, I think, made a slight inaccuracy here, or maybe significant inaccuracy with the move queen g6, because while queen g6 does cover uh, the d6 square, uh, it doesn't cover e7, and uh, queen e7 is just a brilliant, brilliant decision. And, and quite frankly, not that hard to find when you see that the bishop can't develop, the knight is hard pressed to move, and now you take away this, the rook from going to e8. So queen e6 would have been far superior. Um, of course, white still is an edge here, but, you know, again, we're talking about improving on, you know, these little mistakes add up. Um, so queen g6, queen e7, f6 now, preventing the knight from playing the e5, but not a pretty move to make when the queen is already on e7. And now rook c3. And now, again, Kyle Blanc is like saying, all right, I have the queen e7. I've imposed my will there. Now I'm going to enact more, uh, more problems on the queen side. And Look how quickly it goes downhill. I mean, it's already trending that way, but queen e8, queen d6. Oh, look at that. These little juicy dark squares. Rook f7, rook fc1, queen f8. Okay, we can trade queens. Queen takes f8, king takes the f8, knight e1. Oh, beautiful. Look at that knight coming to d3. King e8, knight d3, rook b8, and f3. And already here, the position is just completely lost. Uh, even though the material is equal, uh, you know, even though their king is not getting checkmate anytime soon, white's massaging of these dark squares has just begun. 
Uh, and you can see the play that can happen on both sides of the board with the potential knight coming to c5, but also with the queen side play with h4 and g4 and so on. And um, again, it, it's just not the type of position uh, you want to get into against Cabo Blanco where you have this type of uh, this type of suffering. So I'll just zip through a lot of the, the remaining moves just so you can see. And I got to c5. Again, just like just like uh, we said before, white, black does not want to play b5, you know, so quickly because uh, you know it's it's just it creates some weaknesses and the knight does not have the outpost. Um, the knight on c4 is not would not have been stable. Um, okay, white wins a pawn, wins more material, and then okay, the game ended uh, because this is just a rook end game where Cabo Blanca is going to take on b5, play a4, and and you know just do terrible things. So. I know he said that quite quickly, but you can understand just how really the crunch moment early on was what to do after this queen b3 move. And uh, h6, bishop, bishop h4, c5 was the concrete solution. But after that, you know, the massaging of the dark squares was at the highest level. I'll leave you with this uh, and then end. Um, so I, I believe in 2006, I, I read a chess space article um, way back when um, that said that this was before Carlson was world champion, um, but it said that out of all the you know, world champions, uh, uh, apparently Cabo Blanca played with the most accuracy as you know, as far as like comparing it to like engine, engine um, at the engines of the time. And, you know, looking at his games, I, I'm not surprised if that's actually true. And you can see his technique is really at the highest level. And he's one of these players. I mean, I don't think every player this would be the case for, but Kabbalanka is one of these players where I feel like if he, you know, if you had him play today, get, you let him study out on some opening theory, he really would be a terror because his class and technical positions was so good. And just his judgment was, was really fantastic. And, the, you know, as we saw here, and the two games we looked at, the queen, right at the, when the queens came off the board, it's like, you know, just tor torture. So anyways, uh, that's it for this one. Uh, thanks. And um, yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully you have a newfound appreciation for Papa Blanca. Stop.